Uh, all right, we're here at Revolution Recording. Uh, we just recorded Shane Belcourt's tune. The yes. name of the song is Again. Again. You want to talk about the song? What's that? Sure. The song. Where it come from? Uh, yeah, actually, you don't know this. Yeah. So the uh, this this song is based off of like it's a he said she said song. So uh, it's kind of based off the conversation I had with uh, um, interviews I had with my dad um, after he retired from being in MAT leadership, and then Maria Campbell after she was sort of involved in politics for a long time, and 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 she has her uh, um, her cultural camp, I guess you could say, uh, and she runs that and does more things with. Um, um, just not dealing with politics. And so when I interviewed them, I thought, oh, this would be great. We're talking about how, because they're both in the 60s. They both did a whole bunch of leadership in the 60s and indigenous rights. Um, and they made massive changes. Because before that, in, uh, I know it's not long, but I'm do a quick thing. Okay. Before, before that, they, uh, uh, Métis people went underground. So Riau was hung. Métis people were totally invisible. They didn't have any land rights. They lived off the side of parks. What was once their land in some cases, like Maria's community, was kicked off that land and it was made into Prince Albert Park. And then now they're sitting on the side of the, uh, on the road, on the road allowance people. And my dad's community, the similar uh, situation. They're sort of mo removed from it and they just work for farms and they're either uh, physical labor and the, and the women are maids in, in the farms and that kind of thing or they work uh, in factories and that kind of stuff when they move to the city so very quiet not much happening but they're always talking about getting the land back get the land back how to get the land back and then my dad's in Maria's generation in the 60s they went to the cities and namely Ottawa and then they went and fought for Métis rights and uh, the goal was to get the land back and to be self-sufficient in that way but when they got to Ottawa there was other outstanding things that they had to deal with, like, say, housing. People used to live in shacks, and then they used to have these barrels that they'd cut off the top and then heat them in that way, oil, oil drum heaters, and uh, people's homes were burning down. Like, in the homes where infrastructure was terrible in some of these remote communities. So then they said, the government said, hey, you know, why don't we have, it? we're going to do this one thing with uh, helping housing. How about we deal with that program? And then sort of the federal government sort of said, how about another program? And you guys manage and run it. And then that's when there was a bit of a divide because some people were like, no, 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 don't take the money because when you have the money and then you have the programs and you have the infrastructure that deals with the government, it's their agenda. It's not yours. You're not going to really rock the boat too much. You will, but not too much because they're the ones who are kind of footing the organization's bill. But if you make it about the land, then you can be self-sufficient. But then the flip side is, you know, well, what are we going to do? People need... You know, housing to be repaired, people, now in this day and age, people have scholarships and bursaries, there's a whole bunch of health and remote communities that are run by indigenous people that hire indigenous people, so it's sort of, it's this weird thing of, yeah, you didn't get the land back, you got programs and services, and it kind of fell short. So the song is kind of trying to articulate the, that battle of like, when is, is someone right, is somebody wrong? And for myself, and I think of my sister, uh, Christy, who's a painter, and uh, all of our friends who are artists, it kind of like, well, people are still doing the fight, but just not engaged in the agenda, doing it from the side, from outside that sort of digging into ourselves and relearning language and living off the land, kind of reclaiming that space, not tied to a government grant, basically is what the song sort of winds up being at the end, celebrating that we're still ready to fight again and again and again, because I don't know if we're ever not gonna have to. Right. Um, it's a conversation. Did yeah. this conversation actually exist? Is this based on like something that actually happened between your dad and your Campbell, or is it? They are they're super close friends. They consider each other brother and sister, right? Okay. Like they're not, but they're super super close. And their their friendship flared up really great. And then they had some parts where people took some quiet moments because someone said something that was offensive mm -hmm. to the other person. Um, and that's just the nature of their really fiery personalities. They're both great leaders, and so in um, they're. The conversation they've definitely had, but they kind of steer away from it because they know that they're just never going to really, you know, agree on how successful or unsuccessful their movement was in the 60s. Um, and that's why when I did these interviews, I did one with, in, which is in the episode, you'll hear Maria explaining why she felt things came up short. And then you ex hear my dad saying, I know we came up short on that goal, but didn't we have these other great successes? You know, and can we celebrate those? Or, but it's interesting. He himself is quick to be like, "Yeah, we didn't get." His dad told him when he was in Alberta, going to Ottawa for the first time. His dad was like, "Okay, I want you to do this, son. 
get the land back, get the land back, son. That was the refrain in my dad's mm -hmm. head of just, okay, we'll do, we'll do this program, but we're going to get the land back. And then, it, it, interestingly enough, for, my, for me, when I went to university to study film production, uh, my dad was saying, get the stories back, get the stories back. So sort of almost like stepping off of the land politic thing is like, that's who knows how to engage in that right now. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe if we double down on who we are and who we were, and push that forward as a new story. That might be something that'll spring, you know, the land movement back again. I mean, it's always going to be there, but how do you get it when the government's just like, no? And you go to court and you see what happens. Uh, musicians. Oh Where'd my you bring god. In? So uh, I I brought in uh, Craig Harley on keyboards uh, and Jordan O'Connor on bass and Jesse Baird on drums. And I've known Jordan since grade four. Um, we started off playing Motley Crue. You probably heard a bit of that today. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it's so he, I had a guitar, so my mom had a guitar, so I was going to play guitar. And then, uh, he's a, I'll play bass because it has four strings mm -hmm. and it should be easier. And then he also idolized Nikki Six from Motley Crue. So he went that route. Uh, and we've been playing mostly blues for a long time. He's a big jazz, he's a classical composer, he's like a phenomenal musician, but, so that was how I sort of knew him since grade four, just always learning and jamming. And then we had a band in university, uh, and I said, hey, Jordan, I got some songs you should get together. And he says, I know this guy, Craig Harley, he's great. And so we got together with Craig, and oh, Craig's amazing. And then, um, and then Jesse, too, from that same circle, they're all kind of the U of T jazz scenes. They're all, when I knew them, they're all jazz players. Right. And then I was like, hey, what would you sound like if you played rock and roll? And it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. When, when was the last time you played with them? I have not played with those guys for about 10 years. Okay. And so today was the first day in 10 years I played with them. And that was because we were doing music and I was doing film. And then my daughter Claire was born. And I was still trying to do both. But it was like, it was impossible to try to keep music going. And, and like, hey, you know, you, know I don't, you, you book a show at the Cameron House. And then you're calling all your friends to say, hey, come on in over and drink beer at the show. You know what I mean? You're like trying to do that while at the same time Race trying life. to, you know, it's like, oh my God, and the bills of diapers and all that kind of stuff. It's just like, okay, well, I'll just focus on film. And now Claire's, uh, my daughter, she's um, old enough now where she's just kind of like a teenager. She wants her own time. So we've been able to carve more time together. And then that's where I was sort of like, oh, I'm going to write songs again. I haven't, you know, and it's different too to sort of, to make music, I mean, this place is so ornate and amazing. Like, this is like, you know, you can come in here and make obviously super hit records that sell millions. And it was, I was interested in what's it like to just write songs if you're just writing them because it's pleasurable. <laughs> you know, it's hard to have, wow. the, have the agenda. <laughs> I think that should be your agenda first, you know? Yeah, exactly, for sure. Yeah, that's oh. a good point. Um, so we're in Revolution Recording. What's the board? What are the mics? What was the setup? What, what did we do? Okay, well, uh, the board is a vintage 70s Neve 80 series. Uh, it was built for RCA Records. It lived in their Manhattan studio for uh, maybe 25 years or so. Okay. Do you know specific albums that were recorded with this uh, guy? Well, I mean, if you think about any of the others that are on RCA during that era, you could okay. probably assume that a lot of them recorded on, on this console, yeah. Um, and then, uh, as far as mics, mics go, uh, you know, a fairly somewhat minimal setup compared to a traditional rock setup, I suppose, uh, because of the live, uh, live off the floor kind of thing that we were going for. Um, you know, using things like Cole's mics for the overheads, uh, but on the drum kit, fairly standard microphones, nothing, uh, nothing crazy. Um, and then, uh, you know, for your vocal, going with an SM7 mm. uh, because it's uh, got a fair bit of rejection, um, mm. somewhat hyper-directional, uh, but uh, it actually sounded really great on your on your voice. I thought uh, really brought out kind of a rich tone mm. in there. Um, and uh, uh, and then, I mean, the piano. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a curveball. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Because it was uh, it was supposed to be uh, supposed to be an overdub, and then as you guys were working out the song, it started to feel like that was kind of integral to the to the vibe of of the song. And so, um, you know, having a giant resonating piece of wood 
in a room with, uh, with drums is always going to be a challenge. So we kind of had to embrace that as being like, well, this is, this is kind of the sound now. And uh, it lends a, a kind of a huge ambience to the, to the drums, um, and which I think, you know, kind of in the end, you guys kind of worked works. with the sound yeah. Mm. And and made it what it is, it, and it, it kind of it turned out great. I thought. How can we hear? It? Can we hear just just, just yeah. how much bleed of the just drums in, in the piano is in the piano? Okay, well we'll stick. We'll skip to the uh, to the end here. <laughs> uh. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the drum track. This is just the, this yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. These are these essentially become <laughs> drum microphones. Yeah. Right, I see. <laughs> I see. Uh, yeah, but great. you know, in the earlier sections, like the piano reads really well, mm -hmm. and then kind of gives a really nice kind of ambience mm. to the to the drums. You know? So in these kinds of situations it always comes about working within the uh, the limitations and the uh, and the challenges that are set by the situation. In this case we were aiming for a live off the floor thing. There's a video component to it so mm. Isolating things completely is not really an option because for the aesthetic of, of right. the visual, uh, and you end up kind of like working. You work with with what you yeah. have. Yeah, we did a couple overdubs. Yes. We did some like tambourine, acoustic guitar, organ. And the organ came in at the end. Yeah. Yeah, and then we got Michelle St. John mm -hmm. to come in and do some vocals. The last minute decision to come in, but it works with the song. Yeah, whatever vocals of mine that people eventually hear was the only single take I took. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Including the auto tune. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. I thought well, because it's a two-hander. Yeah. So like I thought, said, why, not, said, why not? Yeah. And what was it like for you? Because you came in producing this track. Yeah. And I brought it to you twelve hours before we were going to record it. Did you showed it to me twelve hours on piano, and <laughs> it was great. Um, but you had some good notes on it. I had some notes, yeah, some ways to push the chorus, try to add some uh, challenges or add some ways to different push it. We also left it open for the musicians to come in. Because you don't want to, when you're working with great musicians, you don't want to write their part, essentially. You want to give them space to breathe, which the song came in, had lots of space for them to come in and do their thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The F sharp major was your idea. The F sharp major, yeah. I'll take that. Yes, the one chord yeah. at the end of the chorus was my idea. I'll take it. <laughs> my contribution. Uh, yeah. The room sounds incredible, though. It's, it's a really, really great sounding room. Oh. Do, and it's especially great for this kind of a thing yeah. because the ambience of the room is just, it's just so even yeah. and nice. And the drums sound so full and oh big and not crunched yeah, at all. The drums really come alive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was great. Thanks, man. Yeah, good job. Okay. Appreciate it. <laughs> good Thanks, Tony Wallace. <laughs> right on, guys. All right. Beauty. Cool. Well, good. That's a wrap. All right. All right. <laughs>